Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have another episode packed full of SpaceX Starship development updates, all of the happenings over at NASA with the International Space Station, Artemis updates, updates on the Russia v India space race, and of course all the rocket launches we saw over the past seven days. All of this and more, let's jump right in. Oh boy, there is a lot of Starship news to cover in this week's episode. Where to begin? Well, let's start at the launch site. There are no Starships or Super Heavies here at the moment, but SpaceX has been putting Stage 0 through its test paces. The freshly painted launch stand performed a lot of venting tests over the past week. This gas is used to start up the outer ring of Raptor engines on the Super Heavy. The rocket itself only contains sufficient gas to start up the inner engines, since these are really the only engines that it needs to be able to start up on its own, since these are the only ones that need to be relit mid-flight. The outer engines only need to be ignited once when the rocket is still on the pad, so it makes sense from a mass saving point of view to offload as much mass from the rocket to the ground support system as possible, which includes the spin-up gas for the outer engines. In addition to these venting tests, we also saw the booster quick disconnect in action. This supplies the first stage with propellant and power, but it needs to rapidly detach after engine ignition for obvious reasons. The orbital launch mount legs were recently repainted, and last week NASA Spaceflight's Starbase livestream caught workers giving the Starship Quick Disconnect arm a fresh coat of paint as well. The Starship Quick Disconnect arm serves the same purpose as the Booster Quick Disconnect, but serves the upper Starship stage instead. Last week we covered the arrival of the newest high capacity water tank at the launch site, and integration of this new tank into the water deluge system appears to be proceeding well. Speaking of the water deluge system, it was put through its paces during the recent Booster 9 static fire test. We assumed that this went well, but we've since spotted some concrete being torn up on the launch pad. Could this be an indication that the concrete was damaged by the booster again? Or is this just to simply facilitate work on the orbital launch mount legs? What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. And of course, while you're down there, don't forget to drop a like on the video as well. It really helps me out with the whole algorithm and stuff. Anyway, testing of the water deluge system continued with another gas purge of the system on Thursday, which is done in order to not only test the gas system, but also to purge the system of any dust and other contaminants that might have worked their way in during construction. To wrap up coverage of the launch site area, the water deluge system was then fully tested once again towards the end of the week, and it looked like it functioned well. This may have been a test of the water system with the newly integrated high capacity water tank, although we're still not sure if this has been fully integrated just yet. This recent aerial photograph from Jack Bayer shows that it's a little bit misaligned compared to the other two tanks, and we're not sure if it's been fully installed since this photo was taken. But whatever the case, the test definitely seemed to have a lot more power behind it than previous tests, likely thanks to the increased number of high pressure canisters in the system. All this progress with the launch mount is a hopeful sign that Booster 9 will be re-rolled back out for another attempt at a static fire very soon, aiming for full duration rather than an unexpected abort like the last time. We still have no real information about why the abort happened, or more importantly, why four of the engines shut off, which is probably what initiated the abort. Could it have been an anomaly with the Raptor startup gas system on the launch ring, hence all of the testing we saw last week? Speaking of Booster 9, that's still in the Mega Bay, undergoing prep work for the second orbital flight test. The big news this week was that SpaceX has now installed the hot stage ring at its top, which will allow the exhaust of Ship 25 to safely vent away from the booster during engine startup. So I guess the can crusher test we saw of the hot stage ring prototype was indeed a success. Later in the week, Booster 10 was rolled into the Mega Bay, having completed its cryoproofing tests a little while ago now, presumably for Raptor engine installation. On the subject of Raptor engine installation, Ship 28, presumed to be mated with Booster 10 in the near future, saw the beginning of its Raptor 2 engines on the Raptor install stand, thanks to Jack Bayer of NASA Spaceflight for this amazing time lapse of one of the central engines being raised up to the ship. Mega Bay 2 continues to rise, we saw the arrival of two new bridge crane girders to the build site, which will be installed in the building's roof, and these are used for lifting and stacking operations for boosters and ships. We left Mega Bay 2 news last week with the status of the LR11000 crane being lowered down for reconfiguration. 
Well, over the past week, all of this has now happened, and the crane rose again to a much greater height, allowing SpaceX to begin work finishing off the top of the new mega bay. Also on the rise is the Star Factory building, which, as you can see from this NASA spaceflight aerial shot from Sean Doherty, is expanding nicely, and it will eventually replace the three, oh wait, two tents at the production site. Yep, Tent 2 was demolished last week, and it looks like Tent 1 is about to meet a similar fate, as it's now been completely emptied of contents. It's not just the tents that face demolition though, the mid-bay looks like its time is up as well. It was completely emptied, and we're expecting to see demolition of this structure take place imminently, if it hasn't already happened by the time this video goes live. Demolition work began with an excavator mercilessly ripping away the outer metal wall. I imagine that when the time comes, it's going to drop quickly. SpaceX appear to have marked out a full zone with barriers. I'm expecting to see a similar performance to the recent low bay demolition. The high bay was a hive bay of activity last week, sorry that was terrible, but we saw the rollout of the newest fully stacked Starship, Ship 29, during a reshuffle of the high bay's contents, giving us our first full view of this beast. Construction of this vehicle resumed with the arrival of its aft flaps, which were moved into the high bay for installation. Stacking of the next Starship continued with the arrival of Ship 30's aft section, which was then followed by final stacking, bringing Ship 30 to full height. One of the more interesting Starship prototypes is Ship 22 or 21. I don't know if we ever agreed on which weird hybrid prototype this ended up being officially named, since it was half of 21 and half of 22. It doesn't really matter really, since it was scrapped in the end, but its Ship 22 nose cone was spared, and last week we saw the rollout of this nose cone. We believe that this has been repurposed as a human landing system test article, and it has a few unique features about it. Most prominently is a human-sized door cut out in its side, something not seen on any other nose cone prototype. There's not really a bunch else more to discuss with this prototype at this stage, but hopefully we'll learn more as SpaceX continue developing it. We already know that the human landing system mock-up contains just two levels, a single crew deck and a lower airlock deck, so it's entirely feasible that a Starship nose cone can house the entire crew deck itself with the payload barrel used for the airlocks. I think the hottest shot of the week has to go to this footage, shared by SpaceX, showing an approximately 220 second long duration static fire of a Raptor 2 engine at a very interesting angle. We've never seen a Raptor 2 engine tested at this angle before on a test stand. The reason for this curious angle was because the Raptor was being tested while gimbaled at 15 degrees, which, according to Elon, is the maximum gimbal deflection required for a landing burn. We've seen lots of cool shots of Raptor 1 gimbaling during landing burns during the SN8 days to give you an idea of what this would look like on a live vehicle. Although, of course, not all of these landings were successful. <laughs> Speaking of unsuccessful landings, it looks like Russia's Luna 25 lander has met its maker on the lunar surface. This vehicle launched a couple of weeks ago aboard a Soyuz 2.1B from the Vostochny spaceport, with the intention of landing on the moon's south pole as the first step in Russia's lunar glob program, which aims to establish a fully robotic lunar base. The landing was planned to be on the 21st of August, just days before India's Chandrayaan-3 lander was set to make its touchdown at the South Pole, but Roscosmos released the statement that the spacecraft, quote, ceased to exist as a result of a collision with the surface of the moon. This was following a loss of contact with the spacecraft on Saturday, after it encountered problems moving into its pre-landing orbit. A landing that was successful last week was last week's touchdown of Booster 1067 on the assured fall of Gravitas drone ship, many thanks to Fariel for this shot of the rocket arriving back at port. The mission itself took place on Wednesday night at Cape Canaveral, where the Falcon 9 launched 22 Starlink V2 minis to Starlink Shell 6. Here's the footage of the booster landing, which followed shortly after second stage separation, and brought an end to this particular booster's 13th mission. The only other orbital launch we saw last week was from China's Jiquan Satellite Launch Center, taking place on Sunday. The rocket was a Long March 4C, which carried the GFN 12-04 to low Earth orbit. According to official sources, this satellite will be used in a variety of fields, including land surveys, urban planning, road network design, crop yield estimation, and disaster relief. In Artemis 2 news now, NASA is preparing to start tests of its mobile launcher. 
In these photos, you can see the mobile launcher carried by the crawler transporter nearing the pad at Launch Complex 39B at the Kennedy Space Center. These images were taken on the 17th of August, and while at the pad, the mobile launcher will undergo testing ahead of the Artemis II mission, in which the launcher will transport the SLS rocket and, of course, the Orion spacecraft to Pad 39B for liftoff. In other NASA news now, last week they announced that this July marked the warmest recorded month since 1880, primarily due to increasing global temperatures stemming from human-generated emissions of carbon dioxide. Significantly contributing to the efforts in monitoring climate change, the space station serves as a repository of extensive data. This role is fulfilled through three core platforms an assemblage of Earth-observing instruments affixed to its outer shell, a platform that facilitates the deployment of Earth-observing CubeSats, and the presence of windows utilized by astronauts to capture photographic evidence of the Earth's condition. An integral component within this framework is the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3 investigation, which aids in observing the intricate dynamics within the Earth's carbon cycle. Operating since 2019, the OCO3 initiative quantifies and maps carbon dioxide from space, contributing to enhancing our understanding of the interplay between carbon dynamics and overarching climate systems. In other space station news, the Progress MS-22 spacecraft autonomously undocked from the aft port of the Zvezda service module on the 20th of August. The Progress spacecraft are the Russian resupply vehicles, and the next one is set to launch on the 22nd of August, tomorrow, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, and set to arrive at the space station two days later on the 24th. Laon Aerospace was back in action after a two-week hiatus last week. Seizing the fact that Kerbal Space Program 2 still doesn't have any thermal system, I decided to send a space station to low solar orbit. The mission wasn't without its bugs, trials and tribulations, so definitely check it out if you haven't already. It may well be one of those video suggestions on screen right now. Also on screen is a list of all my generous Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your continued generous support that lets me keep on doing what I do here, so thank you so much everyone for your contributions. But that's it from me this week, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Expect more KSP content this weekend, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it, I think it's going to be a good one.